lawyers. I had a cat. <laughs> it's one of my pet peeves is that we don't go to museums enough. We aren't supporting them so that they have to result to ghost tours and things like that. It's quite sad. It's been to many, many um, tours myself in different places, and the ghost tours bring the people in and they pay the money and they go to the gift shop, whereas we don't go to the other events like we should. But anyway, so next up, Kyle Polish. He's a data scientist who, focus, who focuses on artificial intelligence. He was one of our speakers at our first Skeptic Camp in 2014, which really does not sound that far away, but this is 2017 now. Um, you can find out more about Kyle by subscribing to his podcast, Data Skeptic. The tagline is, we explain the methods and algorithms that power our world in an accessible manner through our short mini-episode discussions and our longer interviews with skeptics, experts which is pretty funny, as I was one of those longer interviews back in August of 2014. His first pet was a lilac-crowned Amazon parrot named Yoshi. And Kyle will be speaking to us about something that I thought was one thing, and now I think it's going to be something else, and so that's cool. For those new to skepticism, um, I think he's going to use the word woo, and woo is a kind of a generic term used for nonsense in our community. And uh, without further ado, Hi. All right, well, thanks everybody, and thanks Susan for the intro. Um, as she mentioned, my normal brand of what I talk about in my skeptical activities is all around my profession, really. It's what does machine learning tell us uh, about the world, and what is data doing, and when there are claims specifically in those areas, what is, how should a skeptic look at them? Um, particularly when we get into technical areas, I think it needs an expert to comment on areas of their expertise. For me, for example, um, I know that climate change is real, but I know that partially under an appeal to authority. Uh, I don't totally understand the models, although I can look at some of the data. Um, so I want to step actually a little bit outside of that comfort zone for this talk and tell you a little bit about a skeptical investigation I've been doing. There's going to be some data, but more or less, I'm going to talk about um, something I found on what we'll call the fringes and the, the frontiers of Woo. So there's a lot of common. Oh, I'm not clicking. Um, there's a lot of topics in skepticism that are, are very uh, we're all very aware of. You know, homeopathy. I, I presume everyone in this room, even who came just to check this out, but aren't necessarily card-carrying skeptics, are aware of that and the lack of evidence for it. Um, there's a lot of well-known topics that we cover often and uh, explore. And then there's sort of these fringe things that are maybe going to stick around for a while or not. And I like to think, oh, I skipped ahead too fast. Is there a missing slide? So yeah, I guess real quick, who has heard of the missing 411 conspiracy? All right, nobody, cool. So that's what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, sort of as the centerpiece for a larger discussion I wanna talk about, which is the frontiers of Wu, if you will. Uh, this is uh, what I've observed to be sort of the relationship between the obscurity of a topic and the number of people exposed. There seems to be this exponential drop-off that over here on the left we have things like climate change and vaccine denial that everyone's aware of, regardless of if they know the evidence well. And then missing 4-1 admittedly is very much on the long tail here, not a popular topic. So why bother talking about it? Well, uh, a number of reasons. One is that when it comes to this area, a topic like climate change that we started the day with, we really need well-crafted messages from highly qualified speakers talking about this. Um, I'm happy to share my knowledge of it with casually with people, but I shouldn't engage in a debate on that topic. It's not my formal area. Um, and it's a very important one to our species. We might not be around a lot longer if we don't address that problem. I don't think anyone's going to be harmed particularly by uh, my topic today, the missing 411. But interestingly enough, I think it's a great avenue for an armchair skeptic to do something. So if you come saying, hey, I can't talk about these big issues, there might be small issues that you can talk about. And this is one I found and I think actually can have some values that you'll, you'll see in my conclusion step. So um, I never, you know, I'm 35 years old. I never subscribed to magazines. No offense, Ben or, or, or Susan. Not. I subscribe to Skeptical Inquirer digitally on Pocket Mag, so I do get that. But, uh, I never subscribed to Playboy, and I'm not a prude. Uh, I don't mind if people do, but uh, those that do sometimes feel this need to say, like, well, I, I only do it for the articles. Like, that there's something unacceptable about this, and we have to make an excuse. So uh, I don't have to make this excuse, not being a subscriber to that publication, but I did come here today to make sort of a confession of my own. 
and that's that I listen to an abnormally high number of paranormal podcasts, but I only listen for the music. <laughs> By the way, the Mysterious Universe, fantastic music. You should listen for that, and myself and other skeptical podcasters might take a note about following some of those production values, because they really do have good audio on that show. Um, and they're not the worst of the shows. They're, they're definitely bent on woo and paranormal stuff, but there are grains of skepticism in there. There are much show, worse shows I listen to. Um, so why do I do this? Why do I choose to invest my time listening to stuff like this, uh, amidst, amongst other things that are, I consider more valuable? A number of reasons. I think first and foremost, in addition to being a skeptic, I have, as, as many of us do, this sort of love of folklore and story. Uh, I can really enjoy a ghost story around a campfire, a work of fiction around a campfire. Uh, that's just the theme that we have there. And in the same sense, I love kind of picking apart what are the kookiest ideas people can come up with? Why do they believe them? Um, how do they defy logic and see these things as being truthful? And I love to get goosebumps from kind of a wacky or crazy interesting story. So uh, I also like to think of these sort of things as reflections of our society. Like what does it tell us that we're afraid of uh, certain types of monsters, and how do different cultures' monsters help us interpret them. So that's part of my excuse for listening to a lot of woo shows. But I also feel it's part of my duty as a skeptic to kind of be on the lookout. And then I'm keeping an eye on these guys to say, well, what, what is on the fringes that might emerge? Because there are topics that will come into the paranormal sphere and maybe disappear because they're ludicrous, and others that might gain some momentum and traction. And I think the skeptical community should be aware of them long before the general public so that we're able to adequately comment about them uh, as they bubble up. And that's, in listening to some of these nonsense type podcasts, I came across this Missing 411, which uh, is foundationally with these four books from author David Polites. So Polites, uh, uh, he doesn't necessarily articulate precisely what it is, which is part of the problem, although I'll get to his definition. But let me first say a little bit about how I discovered it. He gets on and does these interviews where he says that there are clusters of people who are going, or clusters of missing persons cases all across the country, and some of them are centered around national parks. Now, clustering caught my attention because it's something I do a lot of professionally. I know almost all the clustering algorithms and how they work, and I thought, hey, this would be a cool thing for me to do some data science related to see if these are indeed clusters or what they might mean. Um, as it turns out, his data doesn't really beget that sort of analysis. But I got really interested in, like, what is he actually claiming here? So let's go to, uh, as close as I can get to his definition out of one of his books. There is a series of missing people. Oh, sorry. Let me read it more like Robert Stack from Unsolved Mysteries. Right? There is a series of missing people inside our national parks. The events were very unusual. And the Park Service were doing everything possible to keep a lid on the publicity. Okay, so we've got unusual stuff, we've got a conspiracy inside the public uh, park system. Cool, this is interesting, let's go with it and see where he ends up. Uh, Polites talks a lot about the pattern of the missing 401, which, as you might ex uh, expect, someone has to have gone missing. The victims are often found a distance and or elevation away that defies common sense. Um, now that's interesting because it's not exactly testable, but we can measure it. What does it mean to defy common sense? And as I went through a lot of his documented cases, there are over 1,400 of them, so I didn't go through all in detail, but the biggest distance I could find was someone uh, was known to be in a particular location, a hiker, and they were found three days later, uh, I think it was 14 miles from their last known location. So I'm a hiker, not like a hardcore one, but I, I could travel 14 miles in three days. Now, of course, that does depend on the terrain and the elevation, so there could be something to this, but I was unable to substantiate it looking at his, place, at his claims and cases. Although there were some where it's like, yeah, it is weird that a child traveled five miles. That's also not implausible. But this is one of the hallmarks of the missing 411 cases. Also, uh, Polites, a former police officer was very concerned with the fact that canines couldn't pick up the scent of these people. I actually don't know how to test this. I don't know enough about dog training and that sort of thing, but interesting. Um, some victims' clothings were found removed, typically pants and or shoes, boots. Why are they removed? It's mysterious. And there's also a theme that Pilates kind of lays in here that this wouldn't happen. He's always saying no person would do this. No one would remove their boots in the cold. And of course, no rational person acting you know, well would seemingly want to do that, but uh, we don't necessarily know what that person was thinking. 
Um, and lastly, in the case of children, a child's scream is often heard before their disappearance. But that's optional. You can be a child and disappear and still be a missing 411 case, so it's proof if it's there, and it's not proof against if it's missing. Um, so I'm still a little confused. What the heck is missing 411, right? As best I can tell, it breaks down to the fact that people are just going missing mysteriously from wilderness areas. He talks a lot about national parks, but the cases cover generally wilderness areas. So let's think about that one for a second. I think it would be hard to disappear from the middle of Times Square. Certainly you could be abducted, you know, something like that, by a human, not by an alien, but uh, someone could kidnap you in Times Square. But it seems unlikely that in a dense urban area you would disappear. A wilderness area seems like the place one might disappear from. I also was interested in, well, what are the statistics of this? Because people do disappear. That's an unfortunate reality in our world. Not very often, but it happens. So in order for this to be mysterious, they have to disappear at some rate greater than what we would expect. Um, surely there are people who want to disappear, perhaps the laws after them, or debtors, or something like that, and wouldn't a national park maybe a, be a great place to start your disappearing act? Because uh, uh, we just visited Yellowstone, or Yosemite, a couple of uh, months ago, and you know, no cameras, lots of empty spaces, you could supposedly be camping there all the while making your way to Mexico. So this is also one plausible explanation for some disappearances, um, some of these people are never found. And this is actually the most interesting part I found. There are people who qualify as uh, missing 411 cases that are not actually missing. They have been found. Uh, but many are, they're just, just missing for a while. Many are, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Are, are these all people who registered at the park that they were going into the park and then didn't, you know, sign out, you know? So some yes, some no. I mean, there are cases, and, and one we'll talk about, where someone went to like the, their local park to just do a job, where right? I presume they don't need to check in or anything. But um, it's not a criteria he focuses too much on. Maybe they got eaten by wildlife. A, a very plausible theory, yeah. That, that does happen, I'm sure, from time to time. So there are a lot of natural explanations here, and some of it would have to be, how do we separate out the cases that might be natural explanations from those that somehow are mysterious? Why, if it's a missing person, why is it called 411? That is a great question that Pilates never addresses. <laughs> <laughs> uh, at least not in any of the 20 hours I listened to his interviews or the books that I read. Um, as I was expecting it to be like there were 411 special cases. No, I guess it's missing info, but that's sort of... Uh, Maybe he meant 911. Yeah, uh, I'm not really clear on that point. Um, this is an interesting claim about people disappearing far away, but it's also optional, so I'm going to not spend too much time with it. The only real conspiracy here is that the National Park Service is hiding something, and Pilates is sure that it's at the top echelons, that the day-to-day -day workers are good people, and he likes them, it's the administration that are uh, trying to fight against his FOIAs and all this sort of stuff. And what else? I'm not really... That's about it. That's what Missing 411 is. There are mysterious cases. But it also is like a template for a conspiracy. You could inject whatever you'd like. If you're a Bigfoot person, it's big, transdimensional Bigfoot grabbing. If you're a UFO person, it's abductions. It's like he created the USB port of conspiracy theories. Just <laughs> put in whatever you have and, and missing 411 fits in for you. Well, and hyper spike. You know, so that's the Very kind true. Of you found you know, a distance from where. Yeah. That's, you know, it's very true. Some amount of hikers are going to go missing. We should assume this as an unfortunate reality. It's if there are above and beyond or unusual circumstances that could be interesting to look at. So, uh, are you guys have you ever heard of these comparisons people do between Nixon or uh, sorry Lincoln and Kennedy? I've never understood what exactly was the conspiracy here. Are we saying that one you know reincarnated into the other or something? I'm not clear on what the point of that is, and that is the same flavor of Missing 411. There's a lot of just like, hey, look at these things. Um, so I'd like to coin a phrase if I can. I, I call this pseudo-woo, and here's my definition of pseudo-woo. There are statements or ideas which avoid direct claims, but live in the milieu of conspiracy theories and set up an implication or a template from which one might infer paranormal, mysterious, extraterrestrial conspiracy, or otherwise nefarious underpinnings. So if you wanted to create one, as I think perhaps Pilates has done purposefully or inadvertently, here's some tips for how you might do it. Uh, make non-specific claims, or no claims at all. Uh, involve real world places, events, and organizations. My favorite is involve verifiable but irrelevant facts. <laughs> uh, and 
You know, do what Chris Carver did on the X-Files. Don't show us. Let our imaginations fill in the blanks. These seem to be successful ways to create your own sort of pseudo-woo conspiracy. So I've made what a, oh, a little bit of background on Applides. Uh, he is a Bigfoot researcher. Even though he has uh, adamantly said that uh, he's not claiming that Missing 401 relates to Bigfoot at all. It might, but he doesn't say that it does. Uh, he created the North American Bigfoot Search. This is his book, Tribal Bigfoot. I haven't read this one, but it looks cool. Um, and he's appeared on Coast to Coast and tons of the other shows. In fact, they seem to be his primary outlet for sharing this message, not news, you know, mainstream news media. He really has gone the paranormal route with this. And while all that's interesting and, and raises some doubts, I do feel the need to point out that all of these are straw man arguments. There's no reason he couldn't be correct and onto something while also believing in nonsense. You know, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, famous scientists even uh, believe in truthful good science, but something that was non-scientific. So I also thought, you know, as much as some of this seems silly and sensationalism, it, it is plausible that Paul Lai, somewhere in those 1400 cases, could have stumbled onto something. Maybe an underfunded police or parks department uh, has not had the resources to identify that there's a serial killer at work. Well, the, there have been serial killers. Sure. Uh, and uh, this, that is a plausible thing, and perhaps this man's work could help uh, uncover that in some way. So I wanted to treat this with some seriousness, and I, I said, you know, this is time I should do my own skeptical investigation of what I can with this topic. So I started out where I think everyone should start out a good skeptical investigation with Hyman's imperative. Let's first establish is something actually there before we go researching it. So um, I got uh, one of the resources that was really helpful to me. I didn't know about this before. This is where I got most of the data I looked at. The National Missing and Unidentified Person System. This is a database. You, it's not easy to get access to all of it, but you can search by name and some details. They're tracking about 24,000 cases, um, 12,000 open cases of missing people in the U.S. And so a little under, about a half a percent of those qualify as missing 411 cases, according to the up forthcoming movie trailer for the missing 411. I guess there's a documentary or movie on the way, which this would make a cool movie, right? All this is an interesting pitch. It's sort of a Blair Witch kind of thing. But uh, Pilates means it in a factual way, unless he's really going to impress me with some social media turn about ha ha ha, this was all a uh, PR kind of thing, but I don't believe that's going to happen. So to Hyman's imperative, I want to do some fact checking. I took a random number generator and picked five random pages out of Pilates' book and said I'm going to audit the first case on each of these five pages. So first one I found, Amy Bechtel. Uh, she disappeared from Shoshone National Forest. This was in the 90s in Wyoming. I think these five cases will also give you a sense of the flavor of what he covers. Uh, her car was found abandoned in the park, and it was she was known to be preparing for some sort of jog or hike, so the idea was she went there to train. Um, years later, her body was never recovered. Years later, her wristwatch was found located in a riverbed, which seems to be evidence for her uh, you know, uh, being deceased. Uh, what, so all this is true. I was able to verify all of this. What Pilates failed to mention was that the police named two suspects in this case, never arrested anyone. The first suspect was the husband. Um, and as best I can tell, just to be clear, I have no reason to believe the husband was in any way guilty. I think in any missing person's case, the spouse should be a suspect, if nothing else, to just establish that they weren't, uh, that you know they're innocent. There was another criminal that they knew was in the area at the time that could have been. So uh, no conclusive evidence as far as the police were concerned, but certainly within the realm of this being not anything mysterious. And then comes one of my, the most delightful parts about reading his book. So Pilates writes a lot like a police officer probably writes a police report. It's very dry and a little bit boring and matter of fact. But then you get these gems of just wonderful stuff where I wonder if he's playing with me. So he goes on in this case to say, Amy Wagner also went missing from this area in 2005. Both their names start with an A, and their first names only have three letters. And this is when I knew I had to double down on my investigation, because I have several friends whose names start with A and are three letters long. So in the interest of their safety, I wanted to definitely get through your education. Um, next one, Carl Landers, 69 years old. And Pilates does this thing with a lot of people, Carl included, where he describes them as just being the peak of physical condition and the utmost of health. And, and Carl was a, an amazing, avid hiker. And if you're hiking, I hope to be hiking at 69. So applause to Carl here to be able to do that. That's impressive. But I think we can safely say he was no Olympic athlete. Um, he was actually struggling already on this climb of Mount Shasta. 
And Pallades reports that winds were estimated up to 70 miles an hour. I couldn't confirm that, but I'll take his word for it, because it's really it's evidence to me that this was just sort of unfortunate circumstances when Carl went off on his own and was never seen or heard from again. Um, so I don't know what's mysterious. And then again, here's one of these gems. According to local legends, who's <laughs> called Lemurians live underneath Mount Shasta. Maybe the Lemurians got caught. <laughs> That's either true or false, so yeah, maybe they did. Um, and in fairness, I think this was a quote of a local, not a direct uh, a theory from Pallades, but it's in the book nonetheless. Um, these others are a little bit banal, but I confirmed that they were all correct, but for, for the sense of getting an idea of what these cases are, oh, a small mistake, I, I wouldn't fault Pallades for this. He said he was 29, actually 39, but uh, this guy just disappeared from a, a hiking trip. Uh, this one's a really sad one. This is a one-year-old boy. Um, and Pilates reports that his parents' remains were found scattered about. Uh, I couldn't confirm that. What I could confirm was that their car broke down and the parents began walking during a heavy snowstorm. Um, he didn't report that. And also, I found that the police had several reports of heavy drug use amongst the parents. Um, so to me, this is an unfortunate case of perhaps someone who has a problem with addiction, they're not getting treated, uh, was in a dire circumstance and didn't take or wasn't able to take care of their child and that's what happened and the baby was never found uh, but I don't see what's so mysterious about this one um, lastly and, and uh, another sort of sad but banal one a hunter my fifth random choice uh, they found his car they never found his body so these are the mysterious missing 411 cases uh, oh also another gem this is my favorite the fact that berries and berry bushes play a common role in many disturbances is quite intriguing. Huh? Isn't it ever? I don't know where that's even leading. It sounds like something that next we would talk about the fey folk or something like that, but it's just there and then we move on. So it's the berries the Lemurians grow. Must be, yes. The berries the Lemurians grow. Even. So um, then I, I started just to give a summary in, in the main book I read. Uh, the first 19 cases, uh, 13 people were never found. Uh, three were found dead of, to me, seemingly unshocking causes. Three were found alive. And it's interesting to note ages 2, 2, and 6. So if we, if we look at this age distribution, this is the uh, summary of every report in the, this uh, Western U.S. book. Uh, I don't know what my thesis is here per se, but uh, I do think it's interesting that the three people that were found of the first 19 cases are all very young. If someone, uh, an adult or a teenager, were found and Pilates said, well, what mysterious happened to you? What mysterious thing? You know, was there Bigfoot? Was there some gateway or who knows what? Uh, and those people said, no, I just slipped and broke my ankle and waited for help. That wouldn't be mysterious. So the fact that an adult could be missing and found sort of precludes the mystery in and of itself. Whereas a child, a two-year-old, let's say, might have trouble describing what happened to them or where they were, and thus they could be part of this mystery. Um, the cases he's tracking seem to be uh, increasing, but I suspect that's more just a selection bias and that he was able to find more recent cases. The internet probably covers these decades a lot better than it covers these. Um, so there's a lot of light touch conspiracy in here, and this is, if anything, maybe the most damaging part. These are some quotes where Essentially, Pilates is attacking the National Park Service. He filed a lot of FOIA requests and things like that. Um, and it's his opinion that he's being obstructed from getting access to this data, and that surely the National Park Service is tracking all these missing persons cases. When, in fact, I, th I think that's highly implausible. I, I would suspect their limited resources are spent on maintaining their parks, and that the police should be the people tracking these sorts of cases. But nonetheless, uh, that's part of the claim. and. Uh, if anything, I, I think that part of the detrimental side to this could be if in any way he damages the National Park Service, which I consider a treasure of our country. So um, let's talk about some non-mysterious reasons why people might go missing that explain this. I think uh, in a lot of hiking cir circumstances, going off the trail, falling and becoming immobilized, <coughs> far from where anyone could hear you or in a situation where you're not able to shout, is a good reason for a disappearance, drowning, exposure to elements. Certainly there are some murders and kidnappings that do happen, that's an unfortunate circumstance, and surely some of Pilates' cases fit, uh, even though we don't know it, or know which ones fit into that category. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, people do want to escape or deliberately disappear. Uh, bear attacks seem plausible to me, and also you know, a sudden health crisis when you're far from contact, uh, out of cell service, these sorts of things. It doesn't seem unreasonable that any of these cases are 
uh, outside the frequency that one would expect or that there's anything unexplainable that I was able to identify. So I was going to put a little cartoon of Tim Farley's head and have him asking this because I get a lot of inspiration from What's the Harm. I don't think I know Tim well enough yet to, to make him a cartoon, but in his honor, um, what's the harm in this? And admittedly, not the most harmful conspiracy or thing to be skeptical of, but the one that probably kind of gets to me the most is the idea that this could embroil the families of the lost and deceased people in this room. This book and his series of YouTube videos highlight people that perhaps grieving families might otherwise just uh, allow to be left resting in peace. And I can't imagine having a, a loved one disappear with no explanation <coughs> and how that could hang over for decades. That, you know, are they still out there somewhere? And uh, might I obsess over that and then have some conspiracy minded person? calling me or writing me, trying to ask me what I knew about the hidden details. So uh, while it may only affect a few, I think this is part of the harm. Um, and again, this the implication of incompetence or worse in the National Park Service, I, I don't know them to be competent people, but I trust that they are, and, and I think that uh, Pilates has failed to present me evidence that they are in, in any way hiding anything. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, I think the national parks are kind of a treasure, and I would hate to think that this could scare anyone away from visiting them or, or tarnish that sort of thing. So, uh, getting back to like, what's the point of this investigation? What did I want to do? Well, first and foremost, I really wanted to see, is there anything to this? Could it be that, like I said, he's uncovered without knowing it a serial killer? Is there an actual problem here? Um, maybe the national park services are not uh, as safe as they should be, or something along those lines. Uh, I would remain unconvinced of any of those ideas as a result of this research. Uh, but part of why I think it's important, too, is that when I was doing my research, I found absolutely zero skeptical content on this topic. A lot of woo, uh, and I hope as soon as Susan posts this video, there will now be one element of skeptical content on the internet for people to find. I think you're missing something. <laughs> I think somebody is trying to crossbreed people with berries and creates a little something for them. Sure. Which, you know, once that becomes out, is going to create a national bank. Very well could be. So maybe write to David, give him the suggestion. That's the very thing. <laughs> That's the very time. Makes sense. Um, so in terms of... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, just not quite on her line, but one thing to add to your list, along with the kidnapped murder, uh, there are people who commit suicide who do not want to inflict the pain of suicide on their family. Some single car accidents and many lost in wilderness can fall in this category. We'll never know. But a person trying to hide themselves before they kill themselves would be extremely helpful. That's an excellent point. Uh, for the anybody who didn't hear, uh, another plausible theory that I didn't list, that someone who has chosen to end their life and not want to inflict the, that realization on their loved ones could uh, disappear themselves and do that in a remote place and, and deliberately be, not be found. Yes, absolutely a very plausible explanation for certainly some of these cases. Um, one of, the, one of the things he found yeah. unusual about many cases was that people were missing clothing. Yes. Um, do you know the phenomenon of paradoxical undressing? I'm not familiar with paradoxical undressing, no. Um, it's a stage in hypothermia. Ah. So you unconscious, you feel extremely hot and you remove the clothing. Oh, very interesting. I didn't know. So hypothermia will make me feel hot, take my clothes off. Okay, yeah. That seems very much in line with uh, these points he's making. And, and there are signs, you know, like don't don't go beyond the rope, or, you know, right. and, and people go beyond the rope. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, it seems to be answering that question I had for you earlier, what 411 has to do with missing people. 411 is normally like the information number right. on telephone. So maybe this is just missing information into these cases, mm -hmm. and they're looking for the goose eggs, they're looking for the magic explanation right. that other people have missed, like berries and <laughs> yeah, extraterrestrials yeah. and people living underneath the ground. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm uh, eager to be one of the pioneers, I guess, in putting some skeptical content out about this for a couple of reasons. One, because we need to balance that voice, uh, since there's an overwhelming amount of woo and paranormal ideas talking about this and other things. Um, but I want to take a note a little bit to what the GSOW does in getting skeptical messages onto Wikipedia. I think there's a way to put little lifelines into the paranormal world through Google. If there's no skeptical content on a topic like this, those looking for this will never hear the contrary point of view. Now, do they need to? Is this a harmful thing? Uh, uh, 
most I think people investigating this are probably looking for paranormal explanations are realistically probably wasting their time. But I also noticed that this is not bred in enough of a conspiracy theory that we can't change minds. If I go to talk to UFO people and I try and explain to them that nothing unusual happened in Roswell, New Mexico, the conversation's over. I will never get through. Uh, similarly, if I try and tell people that there's not a lot of historical evidence for uh, Jesus and that the Josephus reference has been shown to be a fraud, um, and which again doesn't explicitly mean he didn't exist, but is, there seems to be no historical evidence for that, that's a non-starter for a lot of conversations. But missing 411 as ubiquitous as it seems to be becoming in the paranormal world, it doesn't have that same tie-in. I think people talk about it like, oh yeah, that's that thing that guy talked about. And if I can bring something to the table, or others can help with that conversation, say, no, there's really nothing here, let's talk about how you explore the evidence for this, perhaps we can inadvertently teach some critical thinking to the paranormal people, and maybe they'll apply that then to their other beliefs that we might not be able to touch directly because they're so uh, deeply seated into them. So I think these frontier topics are interesting and worthwhile to pursue because I did this you know, relatively cheaply. His books were super expensive, but... Uh, it was mostly my time, and uh, I'll put some stuff on the internet, and maybe that'll help people and uh, get them to think a little bit more critically. And I didn't have to be an expert in this, but people who know more about hiking and hypothermia can contribute some of the scientific data. Um, so yeah, that's uh, my idea about why we should look at some of these frontier claims and how they might bring a little bit more critical thinking to us in general. Um, so that's the end of that. That was terrific. I had no idea he was going to do that. And he is 100% right. We need to have some kind of information out there to counteract the woo. And the JSOW project will be looking into this video. And I really want to see you do an article for Skeptical Inquirer, Kyle, for that art for this. Yes. I really think that would be fantastic. It's a secondary source. I can cite it easier on Wikipedia if there's a web page for this man and the 411 theory that is really fun.